Hey dudes and dudettes, thanks for tuning into this episode of the Be Kind and Rewind podcast. A podcast chock full of everything that is nostalgic about the 80s, 90s, and more. Where we chat with our favorite celebrities about our nostalgic VHS and TV dinner days. This episode... The Quack Attack Dinner Days. TV Dinner Days, that's right, because this episode, The Quack Attack is back, Jack, because I'm joined by the man that you've seen in the Mighty Ducks franchise, so I married an axe murderer in various roles in TV and film while hearing his silky smooth voice sort of strumming his tunes. So I welcome actor and musician Matt Doherty. Hey, dude, and, and Drill Meister. The Drill Meister, yes. Yeah, so yeah, he had this handy because I was trying to. Something over here. Well, if I was present, the the thing, the way things were going on before behind the scenes, if I were there, that drill would be in my head at this point right now. Yes. All your viewer people missed on my ability to uh, uh, actually work the internet. No, nah, it, it we we ran into a a little bit of a situation, but I would call it it was Google's fault. We're just, we're gonna blame that one on Google. You can't take the blame for that. Man. So, so just uh, getting into it, you know, um, we are pressed for time, so we're just gonna tra- we're gonna truck through all the good stuff that we wanted to get through. So, of course, one of the main things, uh, one of the you role, you've been in a few iconic roles in the '90s, but one of the ones that you're probably the most known for is Lester Averman from the Mighty Ducks franchise. But one of the things, I, of course, I grew up with that movie watching mainly D2. I think out of the three, D2 was my my go-to on a consistent daily basis in the summer with a big box VHS. But I. D- What's that? I think I have a copy of it right behind. Oh man, I yeah, I I still have it back home. My mom's got it. In, I said keep that thing pristine because that's uh, that's gonna go in a museum somewhere at some point. But I, I going back to the first movie, I saw that a lot of the kids like yourself who auditioned, some of them lied about their capabilities of playing hockey or even skating. Were you were you one of them that lied about your capabilities? Uh, yeah, I lied totally. I lied to my kids. I mean, we all did. I, uh, I think as an actor, you learn early on to, uh, uh, I remember doing this commercial for like some, oh, I don't know, I forget what it was for, but I remember I ended up having to be on a, on a horse, and to get the job, they were asked, oh, by the way, did you ever ride a horse before? I was like, yeah, absolutely. Of course. So I ended up on this horse, like walking a plank over a bridge, over a, a waterfall. So like a stunt almost. I was ever on a horse, so I paid. So I learned that yeah, you lie to get the job, and then usually it's a little worse. They kind of understate about what you really got to do. Uh, so yeah, both both like both sides are lying a little bit. They're t- they're not telling you everything, and you're just well, trying to get the job. Well, and also like um, uh, so my banjo over here is making some noise. Very nice. Uh, the uh, I mean also like they they knew we were lying, right? So they built in um, hockey camp. <laughs> so that's the funny thing about like the chess game. It's like uh, I think most of us. I mean, I think there were a couple of kids who had played before, but most of us were like, no. But the cool thing was, is the movie kind of made that happen, right? Mm-hmm. Because we weren't supposed to be very good when we started. So as the movies went along, we also got better. I mean, I ended up captain my my high school hockey team. So yeah. Well, nice. Well, the, the pre-training is like the AAUs or like the uh, the little the pre the premier leagues for kids. You guys got that. Right off the bat, with we were the training with some of the best players, like I mean Jack White, who was like our head coach, and Mike Kelly, and all these guys. Like this is what they did. They trained people in short amounts of time. Like Hollywood has. Like I was meeting with my my writing partner on a project, and like uh, I mean literally in Hollywood, you can go and find the FBI expert in town, and that dude's like say a retired FBI. Agent. Yeah, just a consultant was, at this point. Yeah, man. So that's the thing is you get to learn to do it. Quick. Well, nice. Would you jump on the blades here and there and uh, stroll around the oh, middle yeah. middle of Mall of America here and there, or is it just in the L.A. area? I had, I had a rollerblader around the Mall of America since I did the best. Yeah. <laughs> well, nice. Well, other things, too, I saw that you in- initially um, auditioned for Fulton Reed. Is that right? Yeah, as I recall, uh, that's the thing. Like, they were throwing all kinds of roles. There. You guys were just probably auditioning for various, which ones they thought you might fit in? They just wanted to get the group of kids together, and I remember, I don't think I actually met Les Averman until I was in uh, the casting office in Minnesota. They flew us up for a screen test, and that's when they did all that stuff. And this is when they had the tapes they put in the mail, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I hadn't really got introduced to Les until, like, literally I was in the room, and Jordan gives me the sides. I go outside, look at the lines, come back inside, and read Les, and that's when I got the part. 
Okay, so it wasn't one of those. You came in, you had like the bandana and the fingerless gloves. You're like, I'm totally going Fulton Reed all the way on this. You were just. You... I, I just, I was just, I would have done any of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it's, I mean, I want, I'm pretty sure that's how they probably did it in most of those movies where they I had mean, lots of kids. They're just like, whoever fits what. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, like, I, nobody knows. It's like, we didn't know we were making an iconic film. You yeah. don't know. You could be making the, the podcast and the whole podcast. Nobody knows. That's true. Stuff. That's very true. Those yeah. Things those things aren't up to us. And then, you know, next thing you know, the movie gets made and then it becomes like this sensation and then they buy a hockey team and then they make two more films. It's nuts, man. And then you got a cartoon cartoon on Disney Channel. Yeah, all that good stuff. So during the filming, uh, you know, your character, Les Averman, pretty well known for a lot of the quotes, uh, the, even the Rob Schneider impersonation. <laughs> Was that you or was that in the script? Uh, I think it's a combination. I mean, I, I Steve Brill, I mean, especially during the first movie, there wasn't a lot of improv, in, man. You know, we were, I mean, I was just grateful that you know you're just happy to be there yeah just happy to be there (laughs) in fact that's a that's a thing to generally carry with you always for all the people that are actors out there you know oh yeah happy to be there yeah Um, no i i I, that was all written i just did it you know you just had the impression down to the t they're just like well he's got it let's give it to him and uh, like I said, you rocked it, rocked it out a couple of times. And of course, I still hear, I still, I have a few friends who rock out the, the, the long lines of, uh, of, of Averman, of the quotes. So uh, do people ever walk up to you? Do you ever get lines screamed at you in the middle of the street every, every once in a while? Or is it pretty tame? Uh, you know, I have. I, it's funny, man. Like I, uh, people do recognize me. Sometimes people will nod at me and like they know me. Like it's like the, the cowboy tip of the hat. Like, yeah, I see you. I see you. <laughs> or no, or just say how you doing, like like they know me. Uh-huh. I know you know me from something else, and uh, yeah, I, and and then sometimes it's it's shocking how often people like uh, remember that. I mean, this is twenty years ago, right? I mean, yeah, 20, like ninety three or ninety two. I think the first one came out. Five, oh boy, twenty four, twenty yeah, twenty three, twenty four years ago. So it's like, but still, um, people remember that and see me. And, uh, and recognize me from that, and that just, you know, shocks me, and it's a wonderful surprise, too, you know, because it's like, that movie, like, the thing people always say is, they're, they're, it's like, similar thing, man, the perspective of when you're on the other side of it, and you're in the movie, it is like, I can hear the same thing from so many different people, and they'll say, like, I grew up with that film, or like, um, and, and, and it'll be the same line, and it'll be like, wow, how many... And I'm like, well, so did I. You know? Yeah, yeah, I watched it just as much. And, like, I also grew up while making those films. So it's, like, um, it's pretty incredible to think uh, how singular that was, you know? I mean, like, to this day, they just don't make movies like that anymore, you know? No, no, they don't. And, like... To, and you were fortunate enough to be in all three movies. You know, we had to watch, we got to watch kids like you know come and go throughout the franchise, and you still don't know why. Like, I wonder maybe just like they weren't available, they didn't want to do it, they chose their core amount of actors they want to move forward with. Because uh, by the time they got to the third movie, you guys had a pretty good core of act. You know, the good team. You just kind of lost a few a few uh, characters. Did they ever say why, or just it was just kind of Hollywood? Just like people, different people come in and out. They chose different people. Oh, I don't know, man. I don't know, maybe the script, who knows? Yeah, well, by the third one, too, I I, I actually I binge-watched the last few movies over the last week or so, getting getting pumped, getting ready for the uh, podcast, and one of the few things I noticed, I actually enjoyed the third one more than I thought, and it's just because of all the shenanigans, but one of the one of the more crazy shenanigans I think they pulled in that movie is getting the character who played Gunnar Stahl to come back and play a different character in the third yeah, movie. Yeah, spotted it. Yeah. You lost it for me. You lost it for yourself. Let's go shake their house. I was like, hold on a second. How did I not see this? So what was it? Did you guys react to that on set? Were you like, are you a different character or are you the same guy? Well, I think it's because Scott like was just part of the team. I mean, we all played. I mean, the thing, I mean, we all, we would skate six hours a day for four weeks even before that movie started. You know, we mm-hmm. Oh yeah. 
He's like, why? You know, okay, we'll just make him this, you know? <laughs> it's like, dye his hair, give him a haircut, and put him in a goalie outfit. I was like, is that Tom Brady or is that Gunnar Stahl? I can't remember. It's like, it's like a young Tom Brady in, yeah, in that Scott one. White. Scott White taught me how to play the blues, man. I remember that. Oh, nice. Yeah, I was just learning to play the guitar then, and like he uh, he taught me that like classic uh, that classic riff, uh, like the um, boom, 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 boom. Oh yeah, the the, fir- the first blues or the first riffs like, everyone gets into. It's huge. Like he's picking up his guitar and he's like, boom, 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 boom. yeah. We had, we had. He had me fooled. I thought he was Icelandic the whole time. Oh yeah, man, totally. The big bad guys, the big bad. At that time, I was like, you couldn't be, you couldn't do the Soviet Union anymore. You know? Yeah. Like, you played as a villain, right? Yeah, I was like Iceland. We've never been enemies with Iceland. Iceland, Iceland. Yeah, they, yeah, they rocked it. So yeah, it was just one of those things I saw in the movie. I was just like, whoa, Did they try to pull a fast one. Is he not Gunnar Stahl? So I always wondered if you guys were like you thought anything different of it when you're on set but of course you like you said you guys were all close together so it's just bringing a friend along for the ride at that point you mentioned ducks too so like you might know my favorite line my favorite Abelman line then. so they're bigger they're faster and they have uh, more facial hair <laughs> yes yes still they probably still have more good seat Anybody can play. Uh, anybody can play uh, my favorite. But hey, but you, the delivery of those lines with the glasses and everything—it's just uh, it was comedic timing. That's what it came down to. Right. Some other thing. One other thing I want to go over uh, in regards to the Mighty Ducks is they had a laundry list of actors who were going to play Gordon Bombay. Did you guys know oh, about yeah. who else was going to play? Did you test with anybody else, or did you come in after no, he was selected? Rumors. I remember hearing all kinds of rumors, but. Uh, there's a there was a people. Did you read the uh, was it Time magazine or People magazine article from last year? Uh huh. Yeah, there was a guy who did a really big article. He interviewed a bunch of us, and when we did the reunion, he was there because he was the big reason why we got the reunion together. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, I forget who it was. Do you know who it was on the line? So what I have from seeing that originally they had Charlie Sheen, Emilio's brother, but then they had Bill Murray, Chevy Chase, Michael J. Fox, Tom Hanks, and Tom Cruise were all, you know, at one point considered. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, they were all, I mean, Emilio at the time, man, he was like huge well, I'm hit. standing there waiting to use the payphone, and this guy who's on the phone turns around and tips his hat like this. And who do you think that guy was? Emilio Estevez. The Mighty Duck Man, I swear to God. I was like, Emilio! <laughs> I remember what I thought was really cool was when I, I mean, to this day, I, I, I hold him in such high regard as a as a leader and as a human and as just a, just an overall good dude, man. And, uh, I mean, Hollywood has these stereotypes that we have these huge egos and stuff. And it just isn't the case a lot of the time. It's a like, it's a rare case, I guess, here and there, but like not the ma- not the majority. He was a huge stuff. We have, and he was dating Paul. He was married or dating. He was married to Paul Abdul. Oh man! Like, I I remember I remember the first time I met Paul Abdul versus the first time I met him. <laughs> I remember he wanted to just make a movie for his kids. That was the thing. His kids were just like there were six or seven or five or four, like right around that age. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was like, I need them. I wanted to make a movie that my kids would see. And uh, um, I definitely remember the first day he showed up, and uh, we were in school because you know you got to go to school, obviously, while you're still doing all that. Just like in the movie, and, you got to go to school, or else you can't do it. And it makes the day really, really intense, you know, when they're trying to shoot, and they also got to have school. Well, we were in hockey camp, and he showed up, and we we're all gonna meet him, and like, you know, right? And he had arranged it with the teacher, so we were actually going to school in advance, and somehow we managed to get a field trip. And then he like rented out this like go kart place with <laughs> and like arcades and batting cages, and he went and like rented the whole place out and out of his own dime. And uh, and then not only that, but like got in the go karts with all of us. Oh, so he was he was part of the he was part of the fun. He wasn't there to just provide; he wanted to be part of it and too. He knew all our names. He knew all our names on day one, like he learned them, uh, like said, like he he was able to study our faces from pictures or something. So it was just like right away, just put everything at ease, and we were like, we, like, we just love this guy, you know. We do anything for him. He's our coach, then. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, good. Like you said, you, the stereotypes in, in Hollywood. Sometimes you think, oh, he's working with kids. He probably doesn't care that type of thing. But it sounds the exact oh, opposite. Yeah, man. We got a blast. Well, good because uh, you know. 
Uh, Emilio, he's done fine for himself since since then. He's been in plenty of other things. Oh, God, yeah. I'm going to turn a little light out so you can see me better. Huh? No problem, no problem. In the meantime, we're moving on to another role that's kind of tested the t- uh, test of time, thanks to gifts and memes, as your character, Heed, oh, sorry, married an axe murderer. Look at the size of that boy's Heed. Shh. I'm not kidding, it's like an orange on a toothpick. You're gonna give the boy a complex. Well, that's a huge noggin. It's a virtual planetoid. Has its own weather system. Heed! Move! So do people still yell at you to move your head uh, randomly here and there? Uh, I don't get spotted for that one so much because that's that huge afro. It's just all the throw. I've had an afro once or twice in my adult life, but I, uh, um, nah, I mean... When people find out that I was in that movie, that kind of—that's a particular type of crowd, though. I mean, that's like a niche. I mean, to me, that's a classic. That is, I love it. Classic. So, uh, for people who do know it, like they're like floored when they find out I'm he. You know, so it's. Uh, um, I mean, that to me, that movie is like shooting that scene with Mike Myers was. Just doesn't get any more ridiculous. Yeah, Mike Myers in his prime, pre using his pre Shrek Shrek voice, like you know that was pretty awesome. So was there a lot of like imp- like with him? I'm sure. Oh, the whole thing. Improv, yeah. So the the yeah, whole scene, yeah. that whole scene itself, right there, is improv, or that was written? Oh, all of it. Was, all of it. You couldn't do the same thing twice. <laughs> and um, and like it was a, uh, it was like a. Uh, it was driving the technology because, like, if you could see on the screen at the time, Industrial Light Magic was doing like the split screen thing. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, they shoot everything on this half, right? Yeah. Thing on this half, and so the, the people had to get everything right. So if you moved like this back here or whatever, it was a, like, threw it off. He wouldn't do the same thing twice. <laughs> and then, meanwhile, everybody else we couldn't stop laughing. We couldn't get through a take without somebody laughing. Um, so it took a long time to shoot those scenes. And uh, and they ne- here's the thing, it never stopped being funny. Every and, every take, yeah. Oh my god, because it would be like a could you get through it without Anthony Lapagula or Brenda? I mean, these are Academy Award nominees. Brenda Fricker was an Academy Award winner, man, and she couldn't stop laughing. We <laughs> <laughs> all. So it was uh, well, it's a test. Really, it's a testament to Mike Myers' improv, and you know, people say he's oh. a little stubborn on on uh, on set, which I've never been a, a first hand, but I'm sure they're mistaking stubbornness with passion. Somebody who just wants to get it right, and wants to do perfect, and from the sound of it, each take being as hilarious as it is, I'd like to see what the cutting room floors were. Joy for comedy, man. The dude, like you could see, he just has fun, and that's the thing. You gotta have fun, dude. Yeah, exactly, and that. He had fun all the way to the bank for the last uh, decade or two, so I think he's enjoying himself uh, in Canada. Maybe making, getting ready. I think he's getting ready to be in a couple of different uh, uh, projects. So he he took a little break for a little bit, but Mike Myers is always going to bounce back because if you're that funny, you're always going to be working. Yeah, and I think sometimes people don't realize who maybe aren't in Hollywood that you know there's a stigma like bounce back. It's like maybe the guy just got a life. Yeah, maybe he's got other things, interests that he wanted to go pursue and take a break or something. Maybe it's a grind. Maybe maybe he decided to go to Tibet. We don't know. Yeah. I mean, Rick Brannis is one of my heroes. I mean, as an actor and as a human, like, you know, like, uh, it was like, whatever happened to Rick Brannis? And it's like, to me, that's such a ridiculous, like, bullshit question. Well, as a person who has a, you know, a 30-year career, it's like, no, Rick's wife died of cancer and he decided to leave Hollywood. And exactly. Leave. It was a personal choice on his behalf. And if, if people just make that, do that little research, they would know and maybe not have to ask the question out of ignorance or so. Rick Moranis even more. I was like, man, no wonder I think that guy's awesome. Of course, yeah. And, and then the, when he's turned down roles, it's because he knew that he wanted to spend still some, spend time with his family. Like you say, you know where his morals and his values are, so it's good. But, you know, it's like they say baseball is a young man's game. Like, it's a grind, man. No? Oh yeah, no. I've definitely heard plenty of stories of actors just like I, you know, I, I did my projects, I had fun, but then I was ready to do something else, and yeah, that's just how life, everybody in life reaches that point. You go through, you go through phases and whatever. Or some people do this, and you know, whatever it is, and so it's a. Uh... Yeah. It's a grind. But, hey, real quick, I know we're short on time. One last thing I know, other talent that you do have is, you know, you, you, you make, you're making music, guitars, you're doing the banjo. What other, do you have some projects, or do you keep up with that nowadays oh. as well? Um, well, I write for the stage, and I write for TV and film, and I, I run um, uh, a couple writers' groups, and I work a lot with um, advocating for 
writers uh, advocating for folk music. Uh, I play folk music. I play original like blues and country and all kinds of stuff. And, and uh, I played in the bluegrass band for a long time. Uh, I direct stuff and uh, you know just generally live a kind of creative life every day. And uh, yeah, they all kind of fit in this realm of storytelling, though. You know, which is good. I- like you said, you, you get to be creative on a daily basis, doing what you oh. want. So, and making people laugh or whatnot, like uh, you know, any of that stuff. I like things that are generally like just kind of uh, advocating for people who are you know don't have a voice or just it's got to be funny, you know. Well, yeah, of course, of course. So, where can people find like you know? I saw, I know your music, some of your music on SoundCloud, but do you have other places that people can find well, it? I'm, I'm in the studio on a record called. Dignity, uh, which I've been working on, and it should, we should be releasing it in August. Um, and um, actually, I'm going to the studio tomorrow uh, to do that. We're working on a couple of tracks, and we're getting that ready. And then, um, what do I have? I don't. Uh, I, have, I do have a SoundCloud page with my name, Matt Doherty. That was the song a day project for a while. I would do a song a day. Uh-huh. I played all the instruments and put all the mics. It was just an, a way for me to like challenge myself. And then, um, yeah, I definitely yeah. enjoyed a few of those tracks, and I like the little storytelling in the beginning, and then you know just warping into the the song itself. I like the I like the style. Because most like when you're writing a longer project or whatnot, or you're doing like a film, or I mean, all the work that goes into getting something that maybe you get a shot at getting it made, it's like it's nice to get like something that you can do in an hour. Yeah, you know? exactly, and get it out there so everybody can see it if they want to yeah. see it. So yeah, it's a great avenue. So SoundCloud, where else can they find you online? I guess they want to follow uh, you. There's a, there's a, I guess this like online. Um, what else do I have? I don't, really, I'm not really very good on that. Yet. <laughs> I know I have my, uh, my Instagram page, which I think is my Archie Dolman. I think is my handle, and then uh, uh, I have a, a blog. Um, uh, step into my black. It's on WordPress, and it's step into my backseat. I think is which is when I my chronicle when I was driving for Lyft and Uber during my uh, lean days is a <laughs> nice. So it started as my way of, of telling stories about things that happened in my car, uh, and so that's called step into my backseat. And then I, uh, uh, yeah. And then other than that, you know, just theater work and film work and stuff like that. Well, cool. Yeah. Well, everyone, go check out. Follow him on social media. Go check out the music. That's definitely worth it. Um, Matt, I wish we had more time. Maybe we can get you back another time so yeah, we can go over. I honestly, I, well, I guess the big thing, I guess you know, real quick, just to wrap up. You know, '90s nostalgia is huge. Hence the podcast that you're on right now. You, do you frequent like any comic cons or reunions with the Mighty Ducks cast or anybody like that? Any previous movies or shows? I've done a few. I have done a few, man. I did. Um, we did one in New York and New Jersey. The, oh, the, the Chiller one in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I did one in Texas. Uh, I've done some private stuff. I'm going to. Uh, I'll be in Washington D.C. area for some baseball game. There's a hockey game in like in Michigan. I, I I started doing all that. I think that stuff's fun. Just, yeah, let's say you probably just start creeping around like the last five to ten years. You will probably start getting like I more. Know, like, I'll do I'll do a few on weekends, and it's a cool way to meet people and again hear the same story and like and hear like wow man this really did a huge impact on people's lives you know. Yeah, because like and back then, of course, the internet wasn't around, so you kids had no idea the relevancy or the the impact that you're the movie that you're in was having with everybody oh, around your same age. I mean, they're, I mean, come on, they stand up to the test of time. You, you you're you're gonna loves, li- everybody loves an underdog. Yeah, of course, you're gonna you're gonna live on forever VHS form, which is probably the best format of film at this point in time in our lives. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, actually, I have mine right here. Mine. Beautiful. Beautiful. D3, yeah. Like I said, I I watched it last night. I was like, man, I am enjoying this more than I used to. But still, D2 is true to my heart all the way through. So, Matt, again, appreciate it so much for you taking time to uh, be on the podcast today. Oh, my pleasure, brother. Thanks for being there and and, and keeping the light on for everybody. Oh yeah, of course, of course. So everyone, uh, thanks for tuning into this episode of the Be Kind Rewind podcast. For more nostalgia, subscribe, like, and follow the podcast on iTunes, Facebook, SoundCloud, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So thanks, and be excellent to each other. What's that? You're all over the place. All over. So thanks everybody, and be excellent to each other.